I'm Joey Tedesco, and you're watching the Cartoon Pools. <laughs> Now here's a general complaint that I hear when somebody's watching an animated movie that's based on an actual person or a historical setting. The one that they didn't get their facts straight, or that it's not historically accurate. Now I think this leads to nitpicking, because if the movie's fiction, why does it matter if it has to be realistic? Do you really think a medium that prides itself on creating its own world would try to replicate fact? Of course there's never going to be a straight adaptation since history is being written each day and scholars find new stuff to try and disprove what they said a couple of days ago. Does that mean we should discredit it entirely? No. Think of it this way. If you're told to make a history report on Christopher Columbus's life, do you think it's better to be reading a book or watching The Magic Voyage? Come on, I think kids know better than this. I'm just saying that let the kids and the adults have their movies. And if they're interested in finding out more about Pocahontas' life, then they can do the research for themselves. I think it only matters when there are a lot of problems with the movie, therefore making the inaccuracies seem like bigger problems. And that's where today's movie comes into play. A movie that may have not have aged well, but was received well back in the day, contrary to most historians giving it slack for the subject matter. It's brought to us by Don Bluth, and he takes us through a journey through the most magical of times post-revolutionary Russia and the start of communism. Yeah, we're watching Anastasia. Our movie begins with what I assume is either a very neat stop-motion prop, or one in really laggy CG. But regardless, it's a leftover from Pee Wee's Socialist Playhouse. It's on the eve of the revolution, and the Royal Tsar family is having a party. However, the party is cut short by the trusted advisor Rasputin, who has plans of his own. Mark my words, you and your family will die within the fortnight. I will not rest until I see the end of the Romanov line forever. Everything goes chaotic and the revolution begins. Well, at least historians can agree with one thing in the film, which is as powerful as Rasputin is, being able to survive bullets, being bludgeoned and poisoned, that it's his weakness to swimming that kills him. Kind of a lame way to go when you think about it. Everybody except the grandmother and the royal family escaped to which we assume is dead. Funny that Rasputin's curse didn't include her. Now this shouldn't disrupt your convoluted plan in any way, shape, or form, right? We then flash forward 20 years later. Seeing that this movie opened up at the height of the Disney Renaissance, it was accused of being a Disney knockoff. However, with their musical numbers and oh my god! Have you heard of the legend of St. Petersburg? Have you heard of the legend of the street? Hey! Okay, so I may enjoy some of these musical numbers, but hey, why wouldn't I? My folks bought the soundtrack before the movie came out, and the tunes are on par with something Disney would come up with. Outside of the fact that Bluth is trained in a Disney way, but I digress. We learned that the grandmother is still alive, and that the last living heir to the Romanov family was the girl that fell off the train in the beginning. The boy who helped them escape is now a con artist that would make Tulio from El Dorado blush. He's trying to train girls into convincing the grandmother to believe it's her long-lost granddaughter. All while we know that the real girl has a case of exaggerated movie amnesia and has forgotten the night years ago. Her name is Anya and... Somewhere down this road, Damn it! One step at a time, I don't know the next verse, but I do not care at all, and will be home! Okay, I gotta stop doing that. So yeah, Anya is actually Anastasia all grown up. She's played by Meg Ryan when she isn't awkwardly rotoscoped like Snow White. It really is no surprise since Ryan brings out all of her quirks into this role pretty much playing a caricature of herself. They say you're the man to see even though I can't tell you who said that. Hmm. Hey, what are you circling me? What, are, what, were you a vulture in another life? She's left with the motivation of most 90s era animated princesses, which is to discover and want more out of life. After posing to what I assume is an 80s era John Hughes film poster, Anya finds her way to the abandoned palace and this happens. Dancing bears, painted wings, these I almost remember. Soon will be home with me, 
once upon a December. Oh, let's look at this from another perspective. Is it me? Do I find it kind of creepy that she's dancing around shades of people who are most likely killed or dead? When did this become a part of the Haunted Mansion ride? So yeah, she gets interrupted by the con artist Dimitri, as well as his glorious 90s boy band Locks of Hair that has a character of its own. I'm gonna call him Joel. And is convinced that he's found the perfect girl for the role of Anastasia. He's tried convincing her as Anya says the line that's bound to piss off a lot of feminists watching the film. Yeah, I guess every lonely girl would hope she's a princess. <laughs> so when they're off to Paris, Rasputin's old minion, Bat, voiced by Hank Azaria, Yeah, that's pretty much the 90s in a nutshell. Is summoned to his master's new location. We learn that Rasputin is now a living corpse, falling apart in his hellish dimension surrounded by technicolored demon beetles. Now that's pretty hardcore. He discovers from Bartok, who's pretty much Azaria, giving a confused Russian impersonation of Moe from The Simpsons, that Anastasia is alive. Yeah, ain't that the kick in the head? I guess a curse just ain't what it used to be, huh, sir? This causes Rasputin to do the most diabolical of things in the film. Sing one of the best songs in the soundtrack. Nope, can't excuse this one. In the dark of the night, evil will find her. Find her. In the dark of the night, hell will fall. Rasputin then sends an army of minions to attack the train Anya's on, leading to one of the best scenes in the film. It's complete with funny lines. It's what I hate about this government. Everything's in red. Good action, and overall tone from an Indiana Jones film. Except with pseudo-Disney characters. Granted, the movie then follows a formula at this point. It goes like this. Anya becomes closer to discovering her inner duchess, Rasputin schemes an attack, and is then foiled. Yeah, I won't even bother. This songs are worth skipping around this point. If I can learn you to do it, do it, you can learn to do it. Something in your nose. It. There's nothing to it. Follow in my footsteps. And you know, for a movie that's accused of ripping off Disney, so far I'd say it's in tune with the usual blue. Okay, there's no denying they literally took the same model sheet from the little mermaid in this scene. Here's the hoping Rasputin makes a grand attempt in this scene. Speaking of which, this is probably one of the best attacks Rasputin makes, when instead of attacking her physically, he makes a dream of long-lost memories of her gone family, coaxing her to jump off the side of a ship, eventually leading to Blute's dose of demonic imagery for the day, which seems to be a recurring theme in his films. It's kind of strange considering that he was brought up as a Mormon. So after Dimitri saves her, and yet another moment feminists would probably rip their hair out, Watching a dashing young male save the hero who could fend for herself. Ah, yeah, don't worry, we got the ending to look forward to. The gang gets to Paris, and the movie begins to pick up again. We see that Anya has permission to be in the same vicinity as a grandmother, played by Angela Lansbury. The part where they get to Paris must have been a lot of fun for the animators, as we see caricatures of period-appropriate celebrities, some of which are Lindbergh and Toulouse who's now an aging dinosaur versus a middle-aged dwarf for some reason. We later get the typical misunderstanding in animated films, where the grandmother tells Dimitri that his con won't fool her now knowing that he has Anastasia. This scene doesn't really do anything, rather than rehash an old cliché at this point. Eventually, Dimitri convinces the grandmother that she's in fact the real Duchess. To show that he really cares for her, Dimitri and Joel leave without the reward money for returning her. It's not about money. About a message. Rasputin decides to go back to the world of the living and take care of Anastasia himself. When he does, Anya's movie Amnesia goes away and remembers it was him who cursed her family. Rasputin! Rasputin! <laughs> As they battle, Dimitri decides to join in on the fight because he knows he was made to live with Anya. Or at least that's what the script is going by. But in the end, it's Anya that destroys the talisman that does Rasputin justice, to which was given to him by the dark forces of evil for selling his soul. Okay, you were expecting it. He's got friends on the other side. So in the end, Anya ditches her responsibilities of royalty to live a life with Dimitri. Trotsky has an affair with Frida Kahlo, Gorbachev orders Pizza Hut, all ending with Putin winning a rap battle. Hey, don't look at me. This is Russian history. It's just flat out messed up. Some might argue that this was Don Bluth's last great attempt at making an original animated movie made out of respect to the Disney formula. Others say it's a shameful attempt to cash in on the height of the Disney renaissance. Me personally, 
I feel this was less a cash in and more of a love letter. Granted, I think there were elements that are straight up Disney tropes like talking animal sidekicks, however elements like the pathetic villain from a hellish dimension almost feel like something too far out for Disney. Mike Mignola maybe? Whatever. Granted this movie is by no means an accurate take of Russian history, but why would it? It's got a talking bat and a warlock. It's not really a biopic of the Romanov family, it's telling the story of an urban myth. Anastasia surviving execution of the Romanovs was always an urban myth the same way Court Bride was an urban myth of a corpse marrying a living man. Trying to make the complaints about the historical inaccuracies just seems wrong, an easy target if I will. I mean, focusing alone on the story about a girl wanting more in life, I think Booth handled it relatively well. The songs work. The animation when it isn't awkwardly animating Anya and Dimitri look like poor attempts at rotoscope is good enough. It's just strange how you can have characters animated in Blute's signature style compared to these often dead-eyed monstrosities. In the end, I think this movie holds up well enough. Enough for me to look forward to seeing it again. And yes, sing along with it too. This leads me to my question of the day. Do you think animated films should be judged by historically accurate they are? Comment and let me know. Now I'm Joey Tedesco and I think I'm going to end this video the most Russian way I could. Having one of the fights from Rocky IV while Bass Hunter plays in the background. Toodles!